K. Joannette Oslin, known professionally as K.T. Oslin, was an American country music singer-songwriter. She had several years of major commercial success in the late 1980s. After signing a record deal at age 45, Oslin had four number one hits and placed additional singles on the Billboard country chart during that time span. In addition, she won three Grammy Awards and is an inductee of the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame. Come with us as we turn our spotlight onto the life and times of K.T. Oslin and answer the question, what really happened to K.T. Oslin? Before we begin, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell so you don't miss a single one of our upcoming videos. K.T. Oslin was born in Crossette, Arkansas on May 15, 1942 to Larry and Kathleen Oslin. When Oslin was five, her father died from leukemia, leaving her mother widowed. His death resulted in her becoming shy and withdrawn. The family moved to Mobile, Alabama following her father's death which is where Oslin spent her childhood. When she was a teenager, her mother moved her family to Houston, Texas, where she would eventually graduate from high school. She became fond of music during her formative years, particularly in music inspired from her mother. She studied drama at Lon Morris College in Texas, where she also drew a deep appreciation for folk music. While in college, Oslin formed a folk trio with David Jones and singer-songwriter Guy Clark. Together, they performed in local clubs, restaurants, and other venues in Texas. The trio eventually recorded a song for a 1963 folk compilation titled Look, It's Us. On lead vocals, Oslin performed the tune Brave Young Soldier. She would later form a folk duo with Frank Davis. Now it was in 1966 a touring production of the Broadway musical Hello Dolly came to the Houston area in search of chorus girls for their ensemble cast. Oslin auditioned, got the part, and began touring the same year. In 1966, Hello Dolly's national tour ended and Oslin moved to New York City to pursue acting. She remained in the city for 20 years, where she got several small stage role parts. Oslin appeared as part of the ensemble in the Broadway show Promises, Promises and West Side Story. She also found work singing commercial jingles. Oslin also developed an interest in songwriting after being given a piano. She taught herself chord patterns and wrote music that went along with it. Her interest in country music also developed after New York started their first country radio station. She found the music to be more sophisticated than what it previously had been and began writing country songs after that. Oslin was inspired to write her first country song from writing she saw on a bathroom wall. Written on the wall were the words, I ain't gonna love nobody but Cornell Crawford. Oslin wrote the song with friend Joe Miller, and she would later record it in 1990. Oslin eventually made a demonstration tape of her compositions and brought them to the attention of the performance rights group, CSAC. From there, it was brought to the attention of their Nashville executive, Diane Petty. Petty encouraged Oslin's musical talent and helped bring her music to the attention of Nashville record executives. At the same time, Oslin also found work singing with Guy Clark on his 1978 self-titled album. Through Petty's assistance, Oslin acquired a singles-only recording contract with Electra Records. Only two singles were issued on the label younger men, and clean your own table, the latter of which became a minor hit on the country chart. Electra ultimately dropped her from their label in 1982. 
She returned to New York, where she went into a depressive period and gained 40 pounds. She continued commercial work, but found it unsatisfying. Yet Petty continued advocating for Oslin, and her original compositions were recorded by Judy Rodman, Dottie West, Gail Davies, and The Judge. In 1986, Oslin decided to make a final effort to regain a recording contract. She borrowed $7,000 from her aunt, lost 40 pounds, rented a Nashville nightclub, and invited record executives to a one-time music showcase. The next morning, I sat waiting for the phone to ring. It did not, she recounted. Yet through her connections, Oslin contacted Nashville producers Harold Shett, who had recently been successful recording Alabama. Shett convinced Oslin to record three of her original tunes, and he eventually became her full-time production collaborator. She also met RCA Records executive Joe Galante in 1986. Galante believed Oslin had potential and signed her to RCA in 1986 when Oslin was 45 years old. Now it was in December of 1986 that RCA released Oslin's first label single, titled Wall of Tears. Despite breaking into the top 40, the song failed to become a major hit. In 1987, the label issued the self-penned 80s Ladies, which became her first major hit. Oslin had written the tune several years prior, in small chunks over time. The single peaked at number 7 on the Billboard Hot Country chart in July, and went to number 4 on the RPM Country Singles chart in Canada. It would later win a Grammy Award for Best Female Country Vocal Performance and Song of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards. Oslin became the CMA's first female artist to win Song of the Year accolades. 80s Lady also received a positive response from critics. In July 1987, Oslin's debut studio album of the same name was released on RCA. It became the highest charting album by a female country artist in 20 years, topping the Billboard Top Country album chart in February of 1988. It was also her highest charting release on the Billboard 200, reaching a peak of 68 in March of 1988. Nan would later certify platinum in the United States for selling over 1 million copies. Both of the follow-up singles to 80s Ladies, Do Ya and I'll Always Come Back, reached number one on the country chart. Oslin's musical success allowed her to become more financially stable. By 1988, she purchased her first house, but was rarely home due to a demanding tour schedule. That year, she toured with Alabama and George Strait and recorded her second album for RCA. In August 1988, this woman was released. Oslin wrote or co-wrote all ten of the album's tracks. It produced the number one hit, Hold Me, which would also win her a second Grammy Award. It was followed by the top five hits, Hey Bobby, and its title track. Oslin had continued success in the 1990s. That year, she performed at Carnegie Hall alongside new singer Clint Black who also served as the opening act of her newly established headlining tour. However, her constant road schedule was negatively affecting her mental health. She took several months off from appearances to refocus and readjust her mental health. Oslin also took time to write and record her third studio album. In late 1990, Love in a Small Town was released on RCA Records. The project peaked at number 5 on the Billboard Country Albums chart and spent 71 weeks there. Despite the album's first single becoming only a major hit, 
The second single, Come Next Monday, would be her fourth number one single on the country chart. It was followed by the top 40 hit, Mary and Willie, and the charting singles You Call Everybody Darling and Cornell Crawford. Now, Osmond spent most time away from music as the decade progressed. Her last album project for RCA would be the 1993 compilation Greatest Hits, Songs from an Aging Sex Bomb. The compilation peaked at number 28 on the top country album list and number 126 on the Billboard 200. Along with eight of her major hits, Greatest Hits also included three new songs. Notably included was a re-recording of New Way Home. It was later released as a single and spent three weeks on the Billboard Country Chart. Oslin began turning her career towards acting by 1994. This began with a guest appearance on the television western Paradise. Oslin portrayed a mother living in rural America and performed the song Down in the Valley. She would also appear on a television special with Carol Burnett, where she performed a duet version of her song, New Way Home. In 1993, Oslin made her first appearance in a film. Now, also in 1993, Oslin appeared in the television movie Poisoned by Love, The Kern County Murders. In 1994, she guest starred in the Arkansas-themed series Evening Shade. Oslin would take several years away from music during the mid-1990s. She faced several personal setbacks, including a severe depression side effects from menopause, and quadruple bypass surgery. Following her recovery, Oslin was coaxed back into recording from her former label head chief, Joe Galante. Teaming up with sound engineer Rick Will, she produced and recorded 1996 My Roots Are Showing, which was released on BNA Records. The album contained cover versions of lesser-known country and pop recordings. After another hiatus, Oslin released her fifth studio album titled Live Close By, Visit Often in 2001. She co-produced the album with Maverick's lead vocalist, Raul Mala. The album included a range of musical styles such as country, electronic dance, and Latin. Its title track was released as the first single and reached a minor chart position on the country songs list. Its second single, a cover of Rosemary Clooney's Come On On My House, would make the Billboard dance music chart. Osman went into a third career hiatus after 2001. She explained that the decision to stop performing was conscious. I asked my people, do I have enough money to quit right now? And they said, yeah. I said, well, then I quit. She spent frequent time at home and enjoying hobbies such as painting. In 2008, she performed a one-woman show, which included music and words. In 2013, she returned to the stage to perform at the Franklin Theater for the 25th anniversary of her studio album, 80s Ladies. In 2014, Oslin performed a live cabaret show, which would inspire the recording of her final studio album. In 2015, Simply was released on Red River Entertainment. The album contained a re-recording of her previous material and one new track titled Do You Think About It? Simply contained a session band that consisted of only four players. Oslin went into her final retirement following the record's release. Now, Oslin never married. However, she did have several long-term relationships through middle age. This included a several-year relationship in the 1970s with Alan Rubin, a musician and former member of the Blues Brothers. The relationship dissolved after two years. It was Reuben who gave Oslin her first piano following their separation. Oslin would dive into songwriting following her breakup. Now, Oslin later 
dated record producer Steve Buckingham and drummer Owen Hale. However, these relationships eventually ended. I'm alone, but I like my own company, she told People Magazine in 1993. That was in the early 1990s, Oslin revealed a battle with menopausal depression. This caused her to lose interest in creating music, including songwriting and performing. According to Oslin, she returned to normalcy after she stopped taking hormones prescribed by her doctor. Oslin's mother died around the same period, which caused further depressive episodes. Now, it was in 1995 she began suffering from chest pain after spending a summer mowing her lawn. It was discovered that she needed to have quadruple bypass surgery after going to several exams. In June 2015, Oslin was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and moved into an assisted living facility the following year. She died on December 21, 2020 in Nashville a week after being diagnosed with COVID-19 during the COVID-19 pandemic in Tennessee. She was 78 years old. She is interned at Woodlawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Nashville, adjacent to fellow country music star Tammy Wynette. Okay, that's the end of our video. I sure hope you enjoyed it. If you like this type of video and want us to keep producing them, Please like and subscribe, and as always, thank you very much for watching.